Okay. Welcome to Investments 101. We're happy to have you join us today. I'm Catherine. I'm Director of, uh, Director of Communications at New Capital, and I'm going to get us started by reading our regulatory disclosures. This New Capital presentation is being made available for educational purposes only and should not be used for any other purpose. The information presented does not constitute and should not be construed as an offering of advisory services or an offer to sell or solicitation to buy any securities, related financial instruments, financial services, or other services in any jurisdiction. Past investment performance is not an indication of future results. Wherever there is the potential for profit, there is also the possibility of loss. Certain information contained herein concerning economic trends and performance is based on or derived from information provided by third party sources. New Capital believes that the sources from which such information have been obtained are reliable. However, we cannot guarantee the accuracy of such information and have not independently audited these sources. Okay, thank you. And now um, I'd like to introduce you all to Leonard Golub. Most of you know him already. Leonard is the founder of New Capital, a 20 year industry veteran and independent practice pioneer. He is a highly accomplished advisor who works closely with New Capital clients in all aspects of financial planning, their investments and their lives. He is a chartered financial analyst charter holder, a professional member of the Financial Therapy Association and trained with George Kinder at the Kinder Institute of Life Planning. Welcome Leonard. Catherine, thank you very much. Um, everybody, great to have many people join us. And uh, we started talking about doing this webinar uh, at the end of last year. Everybody deserves to have it. Everyone needs to have it. And uh, and so that that was the thinking, especially after a year like 2022, where both stocks and bonds were down, and people wonder what's going on. Uh, what's the cause of this? Is this normal? And so today we're going to uh, give you information, arm you with information, so that you know uh, some of the most important basic things about investments. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there in the world and in the financial marketplace, and we want to arm you with information that's reliable. Okay, so here I go. I'm going to get started. Everybody can see we're going to be looking at a whole series of different asset classes. And what you're seeing is, my gosh, look at how small the print is here. Crazy. So let me zoom in a little bit so you can see what we have. What we have is going down this axis, and you can all see this on your, on your books at home or here. These are years on this, on this uh, slope here, and the same years are going down this side as well. And we are looking first at the S&P 500. Everybody can see that's the S&P 500. Okay, from 1926 to 2021. And let me zoom in here a little bit so you can see, all right? Can everybody see that? So that's the top left-hand side of this pyramid. And so the way we read this is if I wanted to know what was the return of the S&P 500 between 1932 and 1939, I would go to the 1932 column right here. And I would go down to where it intersects with 1939. So I'd like everybody with their books to do that. I'd like you to run your finger from 1932, the column, down to 1939, and you arrive at this, 11.2. That means that the S&P 500 returned, on average, Every year, this is not a cumulative return, it is an annualized return. Every year between 1932 and 1939, the S&P 500 returned 11.2%. Pretty good, right? We'll take it. 
However, what can you see about the two different colors in which returns appear on this pyramid? It's not all black, is it? You see, there was a whole outbreak of red. Who knows what that was? Any hand raises? Who knows what that was? What happened here in 1929 and 1930 and 1931? I picked 1932, but <laughs> so who wants to raise their hand and let's test, let's test, let's start with Patty Davis. Patty, you're on. What, what happened in 1929, 1930, 1931? Got it. Yeah, the Great Depression. The Great Depression, look at that. Look at all that red. And so now you know that when we're looking at the matrix book and we're looking at these different pyramids, that things that are in red, those are negative years. And things that are in black are positive. So the Great Depression. So if I ask you, let's do a test now. If I asked you to tell me what was the return of the S&P 500 between 1929 in 1934, who wants to take that one on and raise their hand and, and tell us what that number is? What was the return of the S&P 500 between 1929 and 1934? All right, Rodney and Carolyn. Uh, minus 9.7. Minus 9.7. So how would you like to have for five years on average a Minus 9.7 return. That would suck, but that's what the numbers were. Now you can see as I move down this slope of this pyramid, you see that most of the numbers as I move through the 1950s and I move through the 1960s, Yes, we get some red numbers. So, for example, you can see that in 1966, the market lost 10%, but look at what happened in 1967. I was born 1965, a pretty good year, 12.5%. Undoubtedly, the market was up because the Beatles Revolver was released in, 19, in November, right around I, when I was born, Beatles Revolver. And, of course, I'm sure that was the market to go up in ecstasy. Most of the numbers are, are positive, and you can see 1973, 1974, we had the, uh, we had the, um, the oil crisis and the outbreak of uh, really very serious hostilities in the Middle East launched by the Yom Kippur War in October of 1973, and then there was the formation of OPEC and the oil embargo. And things started to go pretty bad, minus 26.5% in 1974, but whammo, look at that, 1975. Was that when Disco came out? I think so, and Disco brought the mark back, 37.2, 23.8, 1977. You see that most of the numbers are positive. I'll just kind of keep going through this. I'll get better at moving this stuff around. It's not so simple. I'm having to use my trackpad. A lot of, lot of uh, in the 1980s, a lot of positive numbers. 1990, look at all those positive numbers. And we can see, look at that, 2000, 2001, what happened? How about someone raising their hand? What, what happened to the market in 2000, 2001? Anybody want to venture a... Gary, 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 what was that? Gary Edmonds. R real estate? Was that? No, nope. no, nope, yeah. not real estate. Okay. Robbie. Dot com crash. There's a dot com crash. Mm -hmm. Anybody remember that? The stocks that got really overvalued like uh, Dell and Cisco and, and um, <laughs> WorldCom, even Enron, which was not technically a tech stock, but they wanted to be known as that. And and the stuff got really overvalued and and we got the and we got the crash of the dot com crash. So thank you, Robbie. 2007, 2008, anybody can say what happened there? Look at that. 
37% down the S&P 500 in 2008. Anybody remember what happened in 2008? Okay, let's take uh, James, James Houlihan. The housing market? Yeah, housing market, but that, that was kind of what kicked it off. But it didn't just stop with the housing market. It eventually ate its way into those institutions that tend to be on the hook for lots of housing debt. Uh, and it, 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 it morphed from what began as a, as a housing crisis and real estate crisis in general into what, James? Banking. Banking. Huh? banking. A banking crisis that threatened the entire structure of American business. Who remembers George W. Bush? What did he say? This sucker's going down. Didn't he say that? September 2008? He basically was telling Congress that they needed to approve a very large bailout package or this sucker was going down. So that was 2008. Now, when you add it all up between 1926 and, and, and about now, roughly one out of four years is negative. That means that roughly three out of four years, you might expect the S&P 500 to provide positive results. So we had negative results last year in 2022, and the world was falling apart, right? Oh my gosh, we're getting negative results. So I'm asking you, is that an unusual thing that we would get a year with negative results? No, it is not. We would expect to see the S&P 500, which is a proxy for you know, the market, see negative results in every one out of four years. All right, now, I would like to ask you all, now that you know how to read these tables, those of you with the matrix book, I'd like someone to tell me what is the average annualized return? What has it been since 1926 through roughly the present or through this book? What has been the average annualized return of the S&P 500 since 1926? Who can tell me? Patty. Let's go to Patty Davis again. Patty, you may have to take yourself off mute. And by the way, this book goes through 1921 because we're still uh, through two, uh, 2021 because we're still waiting on the 2022 book. Anybody? It looks like 28.7. Nope. 10.5. 10 10.5. There's the number. And the way you see that is it's right here. Down in the lower left hand corner of this pyramid is the intersection between 1926 and 2021, 10 and is the average annual return of the Standard & Poor's 500 between 1926 and 2021. Now, before we go any further, let me ask somebody to tell me, what is the S&P 500? Let's start first with what is S&P? Who can tell me what is S&P? We take for granted, we just say S&P 500, but who can tell me what the hell is the S&P 500 index? I don't wanna go any further until we all are on the same page about what is the S&P 500. So who's gonna tell me, who's gonna tell me that? Rodney, you just took that one. James, you wanna tell us what the S&P 500 is? It's the standard, it's and, standard and poor. And I believe it's the top 500 uh, companies. Is that right? That's right. Thank you, Catherine. S&P stands for Standard and Poor. And what is Standard and Poor? Is it a government agency? Is it a nonprofit organization? Who knows what they are? Are they, are they, uh, what are they? We just say S&P 500, everyone runs around saying S&P 500 and comes up on your news thing and S&P 500, who can tell me, we, it, is, it does stand for standard and poor's, but what are they? Are they a charitable organization that, that's, that's out there to uh, um, help us? 
anybody? Is it a rating organization? But this is Anne. And it is a ratings organization. That's exactly right. They are a rating. They, they do a lot of things. They're ratings. It's a financial services informatics company that is best known. Well, I don't want to say it's best known. It's well known for rating. And Anne, what does it rate? I and guess it's, a, it's, a, it's an average of returns from a, a set of companies. Yeah. So they do do that. That's they make indexes, and this is their best known index. They rate bonds. They're well known for rating bonds. There's another company that. that's very well okay. known for rating bonds called Moody's. Rating services rate bonds to establish a credit rating for someone issuing bonds, or not someone, but an organization issuing bonds and assigns a credit rating, and that turns into what they pay for interest on their on their loans. So Standard & Poor is a, is a for-profit organization. It's not a government agency. It's not a chair nonprofit. It's a for-profit organization that is in the business of, of um, financial analytics. And they've got a bunch of different divisions. And they invented decades ago the S&P 500 index, which, as Catherine pointed out, is 500 large companies. Now, are they the largest companies in the United States? That's my next question. Are they the 500 largest companies in the United States? Rodney and Carolyn. They're not necessarily. They're supposed to represent a cross-section, perhaps, of the industries in the US. Exactly right. It's a cross-section. Um, and we could say that that they're among, certainly it is the case that they are among the largest organizations, but they are all publicly traded. There are no private companies in the S&P 500. There are very, some very large private companies in the United States that are not private. Let's take, for example, Cargill or Coke Industries. You may have heard of Coke Industries, a big energy concern. They are very large companies. If they were publicly traded, if those companies had offered their shares to the public for sale, they might be in the S&P 500. Now, S&P also uh, doesn't necessarily put all large publicly traded companies into the S&P 500. Uh, for a long time, they did not put real estate investment trusts or a company like Berkshire Hathaway, I think is now in the S&P 500, but for a long time was not. They regarded it as a sort of um, abnormal conglomerate, not, not a sort of pure industrial company. But by and large, we are talking about the largest companies, certainly the largest cross-section, that's a good word that Rodney used, of publicly traded companies. Now, where are these companies located? Are they all over the world? They may do business all over the world. But the S&P 500 is American companies. So when we say the S&P 500, we need to be very, very, you know, precise about our understanding. We are talking about 500 of the largest American companies. We're not talking about French companies. We're not talking about German companies. We're not talking about Japanese companies. We're not talking about small companies. We're not talking about private companies. We are talking about the largest publicly, for all intents and purposes, the largest publicly traded companies in the United States. Okay. Now, let's go over to some other areas on this page, specifically right here. I'd like you to look at the area that says growth of a dollar. And what this is showing you is that one dollar invested in 1926 grew to be $14,076 by 2021. Pretty good. That is your $1 invested and earning 10.5%, which we saw was the average annual return of the S&P 500 between 1926 and 2021. That includes, because we are looking at the 
Can everybody see this? Total returns. Total returns. That means the change in the price of the index and any dividends that have been earned. Total returns. Your total return, a dollar grew to be $14,000. And then this chart, which you can see in your uh, matrix book. And by the way, did I get, is everybody on the right page? I don't know if I gave the page out for the S&P 500. It's page 16 in your matrix book. Let me just say a word about what the matrix book is. The matrix book is compiled every year by Dimensional Fund Advisors, one of our most important business partners here at New Capital. I would dare say our most important business partner, and by far the most prestigious and decorated uh, private institution um, in asset management in the world, I would say. When you have the likes of Eugene Fama, Merton Miller, Robert Merton, Myron Scholes, uh, and others, people who've won the Nobel Prize, behind your organization, you are talking about some real intellectual firepower. Why is that important? Because what we're talking about today are the facts, the empirical facts. We are looking at the data. We're not looking at opinions. There are a lot of opinions in the investment business, and there's a lot of money collected on opinions, believe it or not. There are a lot of people who put out opinions and are able to collect money on those opinions. But what I am showing you is the data put out by the most reliable organization that I know of in asset management. Okay. Let's turn to the next page, if I can do that on this. Uh, the next page we're going to look at is page 18. So if you'll turn your books to page 18, and I'm going over digitally to page 18, and it looks like this, another one of these pyramids. And you see that we're getting a lot of red in the same places that we were getting it before down here in 2008 and, and uh, up here in the Great Depression. But we're in a different index now. We are now looking at something called the, can everybody see that? Dimensional US large cap value index. Can everybody see that? So we're no longer looking at the S&P 500. We're looking at another index, another collection, another cross-section of stocks, of assets. This one is not owned by S&P, is it? It's owned by a different company, and it's owned by the company I was just talking about, Dimensional. And I just told you a little bit about Dimensional, Dimensional Fund Advisors. It's one of the largest asset management firms in the world, probably six or seven hundred billion dollars in assets under management. Uh, but they don't advertise like Fidelity or like T. Rowe Price or like uh, Vanguard. So already we have a difference in this index. This one's assembled and managed by dimensional rather than S&P, that's fine. The next word is US. We're still in the US, aren't we? The S&P 500 is in the US and so is dimensional in the US. And it is large cap, large companies. We already agreed that the S&P 500 was large companies. So we're still in large land. We're still in the land of the giants. But now we get a different word, value. What does this word mean? Does anybody know what this word value means? And let me just say, before I go any further, that the S&P 500 contains 
value companies, but it doesn't only contain value companies. It also contains growth companies. In other words, the S&P 500 is both value companies and growth companies, whereas what we're looking at right now is only value companies. The way you can think about this group of data is that dimension took all the value companies out of the S&P 500 and put them on their own. So who would like to take a crack at what is value? This is Anne. I'm going to take another crack, but it's all right, a Anne. guess. Give it a shot. And there are no think... bad or wrong answers. Let me say, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. there's no bad or wrong answers. Nobody okay, needs professor. to be worried or embarrassed. Oh, you know, uh, this is this is not simple stuff. And uh, the way I ask things, I sort of, I don't want to say I'm setting people up, but you know, I I, uh, um, I I'm not asking things in a way where I'm trying to lead you to the answer. I'm I'm just sort of asking in a in a, in a straight on way, and we'll see what the answers are. So go ahead, Ann. What does value mean? You know, part of me wants to say, like, you know, these established companies that have a history of bringing home good returns or blue chip. I don't know what blue chip it stocks, but I kind of assume it's like these kind of tried and true companies. OK, it's good. That's good, because I think what you described actually does describe a lot of value companies. I think that's right. I think what you said, there's a lot of merit to it. Um, and um, and so I, I'm not going to say that's wrong. I'm going to say a lot of what you say is right. Um, what I'm going to be driving for here, however, is sort of the pure definition of value as it is applied in the construction of this index. And... Um, it is possible that you have a company that is a tried and true company uh, that is not a value company. That is possible. That you could have a tried and true company that is more of a growth company. But in general, I think I agree with what you say, and I'm prepared to say there's some truth to it. But I, I'm going to hone it down a little more. Anybody else want to take a crack at what are we talking about when we talk about value as it applies to this index? Go ahead, give it a shot. Does it have something to do with price to value to price to earnings uh, ratio? Yeah, it does have something to do with price to earnings ratio, but but I'm sorry, it does have to do with a price to something ratio, but not price to earnings, Catherine. You're it's all you're almost there. You're almost there, almost. Robbie, let's try Robbie. Is it based on uh, returns in terms of uh, growth stocks provide uh, returns based on the growth of the stock stock price? But it's a good, it's, based it's on a dividends? good idea, uh, but but it's not. It does it doesn't have to do with returns. Um, Catherine's answer was very close. Catherine said price to earnings ratio, uh, but it's not price to earnings. Sarah. Um, I think it's uh, price to assets, actually looking at the... Getting very close, getting very close. Okay. It's, 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 you're, 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 you're now closer than price to earnings. Price to assets is close. It's not price to assets, but it's very close to price to assets. Very close. Anybody else? very close to price to assets. It's actually price to assets minus liabilities. And what is that? What, what is that in, what do we call assets minus liabilities? What's another word for that? We might call that equity value or book value. And what value we're talking about here, the way that Dimensional has this index organized is taking those companies that have lower price to book values. Price is the market value of the company. What the company's 
value on the stock market is versus its book value. Book value is assets minus liabilities. And who determines the book value of a company? Who decides what the book value of the company is? Anybody? How do we know what the book value of the company is? Whose job is it? Okay. Uh, let's go with, uh, we've got two hands up here. I'm trying to see where they are. Okay, Patty. Go for it. Who decides the book value? Patty Davis. Is that the stock value? Nope. Well, it is. It's the it's the it's it's the book value of the stock. The the price of the stock. But the but the price of the stock. Are you referring to the market value? Yes. That's the stock market value. That's what mm -hmm. the stock market determines is the value. We're talking about the book value now. Who who determines what that is? Robbie. So the auditing firms. Yeah, that's exactly right. The auditing firms, the CPAs come in every year and they audit the company and they sign their name and they say, we have done the best job we can do. And we are testifying and asserting that the numbers that we have put into the report, also known as a 10K, that those are the numbers. Here are the assets. Here are the liabilities. And when you take the assets and subtract the liabilities from them, we get to the book value of the company. And so we have now established a principle. There are two different values for the company. There is what the CPAs, the auditors say the value is, and those people come in once a year <laughs> and, and, and they tally up all the cash in the bank accounts and they tally up the accounts receivable and they tally up the plant property and equipment and the intangibles and the goodwill and the patents. And they say it's worth this. And here's the liabilities. Here's what you owe to uh, the uh, IRS. And here's what you owe for debt. And it's that. And we subtract this from that. And that's the value of the company. That is the book value of the company. Now, I'm asking you all, is that what the stock market usually says the value of the company is? What the CPAs say? In other words, are the CPAs of the world in control of what companies sell for? If a company goes to sell itself and the board of directors convenes and the directors say, well, what should we sell ourselves for? Does the chairman of the board say, well, let's get our CPA in here to tell us what that number is. <laughs> and the CPA comes in and they say, well, here's what the book value of the company is. And the, does the board of the chairman of the board say or the CEO say, OK, well, there it is, everybody. We can disband the meeting. We're going to go out and we're going to sell ourselves for what the book value of the company is. Is that the way it works, everybody? No, I thought it was. <laughs> I thought the world was run by the auditors and the CPAs and that those guys come in and say, here's what the value of the company is. And everybody else just says, OK, all right. You're telling me no. <laughs> That's not how it works. Well, you're right. That's not how it works, because we have, especially for publicly traded companies, something called the stock market. and. All of you for whom we manage your accounts are highly dependent on what that stock market says your assets are worth. And every single day, except for holidays and weekends, the stock market opens and people all over the world are looking at the values of these companies and putting a value on them. And how often do you think that the value of the company that the stock market puts 
on it is exactly what the book value that the CP, how often, in other words, is the stock market in perfect agreement with the CPAs? Not very often. You know, it would be a real coincidence. So what is a value company? Well, let's go back to 2008. We talked about 2008 very briefly when we were going through the numbers on the S&P 500. And I'd like somebody to give me an example of a company that was a value company. And a value company is a company where the market value of the company, the market value of the company is close to the book value of the company. It might be right near it. It might be a little bit above it. It might be even below it. What would be an example if you thought back to 2008 of a value company? General Electric. That's a good guess. General Electric, any other examples? General Electric would be a very, very good example. Who said that? Was that Ann? Yes. And why was General Electric a value company? What was going on with them? Um, and this is 2008, before 2008? No, in 2008. In 2008. I, I don't know the reason. <laughs> I, I, I can't tell you, to be honest. It was a good guess. Well, it is a good guess because they owned a division called GE Capital, and uh, it was really in trouble because... Uh, uh, it was tied up in the banking crisis. And um, and so, so let me just cut to the chase. The company I always like to use in 2008 as a value, an example of a value company is Bank of America. So we're going to use Bank of America, but GE was a really good guess. Who can remember what was going on with Bank of America in 2008? Anybody want to talk a little about Bank of America? 2008? Whose hand is up? Sarah, go ahead. Um, I think they held a lot of bad mortgages. Yeah. Boy, did they. And they, I, uh, and they actually needed a bailout, I believe. Boy, did they. Bank of America had acquired a company called Countrywide Mortgage. Does anybody remember Countrywide Mortgage? And there was a CEO called An named Angelo Mozillo. And um, Countrywide was in the business of, of uh, originating mortgages. And um, as we all found out, a lot of these mortgage originators were not doing a very good job of dotting the I's and crossing the T's on mortgages. And Bank of America decided they really had to own Countrywide. They had to get into this game of uh, underwriting mortgages because they were a big bank. And they bought Countrywide. And what started to happen? Well, Bank of America now owned Countrywide. And the mortgages that were on its balance sheet, on the asset side of its balance sheet, went bad. So the asset side of Bank of America's balance sheet started to crumble did crumble. Now, a lot of times banks, when they have mortgages, don't keep the mortgages or don't keep all the mortgages. And that was the same thing with Countrywide, same thing with Bank of America. What do they do with mortgages? What, what happens to mortgages a lot of the times? If you've had a mortgage, you've probably seen your mortgage get sold and sold and sold and sold. And <laughs> they keep telling you, you change your mortgage servicer and it kind of drives you crazy because you have to redo your bill pay. And so who, who, who does that get sold to? Who do the mortgages get sold to? Anybody? Who do all those mortgages get sold to? Okay. Robbie. To other other institutions or any institution that wants to buy them for for their own income. Yeah, 
That's exactly right. They get they they, they get securitized into into uh, mortgage bundles, and um, in the case of um, Bank of America, they would package a lot of these mortgages that were bad, where the I's weren't dotted and the T's weren't crossed in 2008, and they were sold on to really small, uh, powerless institutions like oh PIMCO. Has anybody ever heard of PIMCO? Pacific Investment Management Company, known as one of the biggest bond managers in the world, that would have acquired those mortgages to put into their mortgage bond mutual fund. Or a little organization called BlackRock. One of our business partners is BlackRock, another really small bond house doing the same thing that PIMCO was doing, that would take those mortgages, package them, and put them into the, into mutual funds who would then be bought by, well, advisors like me and investors like you so that you could get what? Paid mortgage interest, right? So that when someone pays their mortgage, the interest would pass on to us. And then there is a little organization known as the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States. Anybody heard of that one? It's a little organization based in Washington, D.C., which happens to be the largest central bank in the world. And they also would be purchasing mortgages from the likes of Bank of America for the Federal Reserve's own investment portfolio. Now, were these organizations really happy with Bank of America when they found out that the I's weren't dotted and the T's weren't crossed on the mortgages that they'd been sold? They weren't too happy about it. And what did they do about it? Anybody? What did they do? Did they just say, oh, them's the breaks? Shucks. <laughs> Lisa, what'd they do? I'm just assuming they, they sued them. Yeah, they hired lawyers. <laughs> or, or, or they took their money away. They hired lawyers and said, you guys take care of this for us. <laughs> they hired lawyers and the lawyers did the suing. And uh, that's exactly right. And so by 2008, Bank of America had a crumbling asset side of their balance sheet. And they also had a uh, really big mounting liability because that's where the lawsuits would be mounting up is on the liability side of the balance sheet, right? Because they were going to be sued to take back all these mortgages where the I's weren't dotted and the T's weren't crossed. And so Bank of America had a crumbling asset side of the balance sheet and a really ugly ballooning liability side of the balance sheet. And they were not only being sued by PIMCO, BlackRock, and likes of the Federal Reserve, but also by individuals. Right. And so the accountants in the CPAs in 2008, September, October, had said that the book value of Bank of America was X. What did the stock market say about the market value of Bank of America? Did the market, did the stock market agree with the CPAs that the book value or that the value of the company was the book value of X? Or did the stock market have something different to say? Well, the answer is that the stock market said that the value of Bank of America was about half of the book value. The stock market said, nah, we don't, we don't think those assets are worth what the CPAs last said they were worth. And we don't think that the liabilities that the company is stating and the CPAs are stating are accurate either. We think they're way understated and that those lawsuits are going to be effective and that this company is going to have to make it right on the liability side of the balance sheet. And the market said that the value of the Bank of America company was half of what the book value was. So that 
company was certainly a value company at that time. All right, so that's a value company. Now let's move on to a growth company. If I took you back to 2008, what would be an example of a growth company in 2008? And a growth company would be a company where the market value of the company is well above the book value, well above. The CPAs say, here's the value of the company. But the market says, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. We know they've got some cash. We know they've got accounts receivable. We see all that. We know. But the company's worth a lot more than that. The company's worth, the company's market value worth, is worth well above the book value, worth well more than what the CPAs say. So how is it that a collection of only value companies gave a return of 11.2 versus growth plus value companies giving 10.5? And by definition, if I asked you what was the return of growth companies only, it would be below 10.5 if all the value companies were 11.2, right? If the collection of value and growth were eleven point were, were ten point five, but the but the collection of of, of value companies was eleven point two, then by definition the growth companies, the apples of the world, would be less than ten point five. And so I'm asking you, how is it that a collection of Bank of Americas, those companies trading with a lower price to book value? How could those companies have given an 11.2 return versus a collection of apples that would have been below 10.5? How could that have happened? Because so many growth companies fail. Yeah, but a lot of value companies fail too. <clears throat> How do you explain this result that we had an 11.2% return for a collection of Bank of Americas versus let's call it a 10% return or a 9.8% return for a collection of apples? Ravi, go ahead. I would say there weren't that many growth companies in the early years. Well, I don't know about that. I was okay. There probably were. There were probably lots of companies trading at 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 high uh, 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 growth uh, price to to book ratios. Anybody else? What? How do you explain this result that a collection of Bank of Americas would have outperformed since 1926 a collection of apples? Ravi. Uh, I will take a second step. Dividends from value companies drive the value up. You know, dividends is an interesting question. It's a good. It's a good point you make. It is true that dividend. That it is true that dividend paying companies lean toward value. And it is true that dividends can be a bit of an indicator of value. Um, it is not as reliable an indicator as price to book because many companies don't pay dividends. And so if they don't, they disappear completely off the screen. You wouldn't invest in them. And so, and, 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 and so um, um, Dividends can be an indicator of value, but they're not as pure an indicator as price to book. Um, and if a company doesn't pay dividends, let's say Berkshire Hathaway, does that make it uninvestable? Warren Buffett has asked his shareholders over and over, over the decades, would you like me to pay a dividend? And they say, no. 
Why would they say no? Who doesn't want a dividend? Well, the Berkshire shareholders say, if I, if Warren Buffett giving me a dividend is like Babe Ruth standing at the plate in the World Series and turning to the crowd and saying, would you like to, me to give you the bat? You probably want to come up here and hit here in the World Series instead of me? <laughs> right? <laughs> So Warren Buffett paying a dividend is like taking the bat out of Babe Ruth's hands. And, and the, the, the shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway are smart enough to know that, no, we're going to let the babe hit. So dividends have some indication of value. But it's not nearly as accurate as price to book. So why, how do we explain? We've got to get this uh, answered. How do we explain that a collection of Bank of Americas since 1920, whatever, eight, has a higher return historically than a collection of apples? And I've already hinted to you the answer when I asked which company was riskier, Bank of America or Apple? And we had a couple of answers. But I think we can now answer the question, which was riskier? You can simply look at this number and see which was riskier. Well, let's do this thought experiment. If I came to you and I said, I'm going to let you pick an investment. You can either buy Apple stock or you can buy Bank of America stock, and it's 2008. You're going to pay the same price and I expect the return for both to be the same. I want to see a show of hands of who would pick under that scenario. The price for the stock is the same. I'm going to sell it to you at the same price. You can take, but you got to pick one, either Apple or Bank of America, and the return we expect to be the same. How many of you, given the information you have about Apple and Bank of America in 2008 would pick Apple. Raise your hands. You got to pick. I'm giving you a choice. One, two, three, five, six, seven, eight. Eight of you. How many of you you are right, lower your hands. How many of you would pick Bank of America? Same price, the Apple stock, same potential return. How many of you would pick Bank of America? One, two, four. So it's a mix here. Look, everybody. I'm not trying to trick you. There's no trickery going on here. If I came to you in 2008 and I said, I'm going to sell you for the same price either of these stocks, and I expect them to both have the same return, one of the companies is falling apart, quite literally, and the other company can't keep its product on the shelf. I think we could say that probably the right way to go would be to pick the one where they can't keep the product on the shelf, right? I've not been trying to trick you. There's no trickery here. Most people would say, I'll take the guys who are selling the hell out of that thing versus the guys who are about to be sued by the Federal Reserve, BlackRock, and PIMCO, and the loans that they still hold on their balance sheet are falling apart. If you're going to sell me the stock at the same price and I expect the return to be the same, I'll take the guys who, 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 who will still probably be a going concern and don't need a bailout because they're not as risky. But what if I came to you and I said, I'm going to sell you one of two stocks. You've got to pick one, Apple or Bank of America. 
I'm going to sell you Apple for X dollars. But I'm going to sell you Bank of America for half that price. I'm going to give you a 50% discount. Doesn't that change everything? Doesn't it change everything the minute I say to you, I'm going to give you half price on Bank of America? You might have to think about it. You might still say, I'll take the Apple stock. But for half price, you might say, I'll take the Bank of America stock. Because all things equal, if the price is half, the return might be higher. The lower the price might make it worthwhile and might raise the return above what you would get from the Apple stock. And you might say, I'll take the Bank of America stock. And in fact, everybody, look at the 11.2. That's exactly what's happened. The U.S. stock market has done its job since 1928 to discount the Bank of Americas of the world, the lower the price to book companies because they have something in their operations that has been higher risk and you don't get paid if you, you or you can't get the market can't get people to invest in a collection of bank of americas unless it delivers higher returns right unless i give you a higher return and how does the higher return materialize is through the lower the price and that's exactly the job of the stock market is to set prices. Now, a lot of people think the stock market is a casino. But I can't take in all of your wealth and your accounts and put it in a casino. I have to put it in a logical system. And what we have is a logical system. You use that system every single day when you go to the grocery store. So let me ask the question this way. Let's get out of stock world and let's get into the world of salmon. Let's say you go up to the salmon counter at the grocery store. And the salmon monger says to you, I got two different kinds of salmon. I got the wild caught Alaskan and I got the farm raised, I don't know, Louisiana. <laughs> They're both $10 a pound. I'd like to see a show of hands under that scenario. Who will take the wild caught Alaskan? Raise your hand if you'll take the wild caught Alaskan at $10 a pound. All right, hands down. How many of you will take the farm-raised Louisiana salmon, if there is such a thing, I don't know, uh, for the same price? Most people would take the wild-caught Alaskan for the same $10 as the farm-raised uh, Louisiana or whatever, wherever they, they grow the farm-raised salmon. But what if I say, the farm raised is twenty five, uh, is two dollars and fifty cents a pound, versus the ten dollars. You might, and that's exactly how the market works when you go to the Whole Foods market. And everybody thinks the stock market works differently. It's this magical, mysterious thing. It's not. It's the same thing. Over the last hundred years, the US stock market has set prices for value companies that are large companies at, a, at, at places, at points, so that the 11.2% return has materialized, which is higher than the 10.5% return. Now, what has that extra return done for your growth of a dollar? Let's go over to the right-hand side in your matrix book on page 19. And $1 grew to be what? 
$21,541. Is that different than $14,000? Did you get paid if you invested in the basket of Bank of America since 1928? Did you get paid for taking the greater risk on the basket of Bank of America? The answer is yes, you did. Let's turn to the next page, page 20 in your matrix book. And I'm going to go to here. Page 20 and 21, we're now looking at something called the Dimensional U.S. Small Cap Index. Again, from 1928 to 2021. Now, we're still looking at a dimensional index. We're still in the United States, but longer in the land body. We're now looking at publicly traded small companies. Now, who can tell me what the return of all the small companies was on average between 1928 and 2021, and I will go over in my pyramid here and go down to the lower left in the matrix book. There it is. 12.1, everybody see that? Yeah. There it is, right there. Now that's more than 10.5, which was the S&P 500, which is US large companies, both growth and value. It's larger than the dimensional US value index, which was um, 11.2, it's 12.1. Does that make sense to anybody as to why a collection of small companies would have had a higher return on average, since 1928, than a collection of big companies. Who, who, would, who would care to explain that? James or Catherine, can you explain why sm the small company collection would have a 12.1% return versus the large company collection? Because I would think a smaller company would be associated with a higher level of risk than a massive company. Yep. You bet. That's exactly right. If you are a big company, you have all kinds of power that a small company doesn't have. You have buyer power and you have supplier power and you have larger barriers to entry and you have. Uh, lower cost of capital, all kinds of advantages. So if I came to you and I said, I have a two different companies and I'm going to offer you stock, you can buy Amazon, something called amazon.com. It's a retailer. I'm going to sell it to you for X dollars and the return is going to be Y. Or I'm going to offer you one called buffalobayou.com. It's a small online retailer. I'm going to sell it to you for X dollars, and the return is going to be Y. What are you going to take? Same price, X, same return, Y. You can take Amazon, a, or you can take Buffalo Bayou. I think most people would take Amazon for the same X dollars price and the same Y return. But what if I said, you can get buffalobayou.com for half of X, the price is half. Now you might think about it and say, all right, all right I'm, getting, I'm getting a 50% discount to buy buffalobayou.com over amazon.com. And when the price goes down, what does that do to the return? It goes up. Just like in the world of bonds. When bond prices go down, right, bond yields go up. 
It's the same thing in stocks. It's the same thing in real estate. It's the same thing in any financial asset. Whenever the price goes down, all things equal, return goes up. And what has the U.S. stock market done with regard to small companies over a, almost a century? set prices so that the return has been 12.1. And what has that done for your dollar? One dollar invested in U.S. small companies since 1928 grew to be I think that's more than the 14,000 in the S&P 500. Is that right or is that wrong? That's my math. Now, you can also look and see, everybody, that this line is more jagged. Those of you with books, take a look and compare the line on page 17. If we go back to the S&P 500 and you just flip between the pages, look at the line on page 17 versus the line on page 21. Those of you without books, I know you cannot see it, but your books will arrive in the mail. And you can see that the line is more what? The peaks are peakier and the valleys are, 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 are deeper. It's more volatile. And so do you get a free lunch? Do you just get to go, oh, I'm going to buy small company stocks and there's no, there's, no, uh, there's no cost? No, you have a more volatile portfolio. The prices are more volatile. The business results are more volatile. And so the market values are more volatile. So there's no free lunch. You have to have more emotional fortitude to stay in your seat to get your 47,760. All right, are you ready, everybody? Let's go to the next page, page 22. We're now going to look on page 22 and 23 at the dimensional U.S. small cap value index. So what are we looking at here? Small Bank of Americas, right? We're looking at small Bank of Americas, U.S. small cap value index. And what has been the return? Anybody want to let me know what the return for U.S. for small Bank of Americas, so to speak, what it has been on average each year since 1928? Someone just pipe in. Un unmute and say it. 13.4. 13.4%. And $1 grew to what? Who can say that number? There it is. 134,192. It's breathtaking, isn't it? I mean, it's insane. It is almost 10 times the return on the S&P 500. In dollar terms. I mean, look at that crazy number. It's almost enough for you to say to me, well, there's some, no way. There's, I'm making this up, right? These are the numbers, folks. And what the folks at Dimensional have done have been, it's so important, and this work's been going on since the 1960s, because we have computers now, is, is an enormous amount of, of really regression analysis, statistical analysis to tell us and to isolate where do returns come from. And so in the area of stocks, we know where returns come from or have come from. They come from value and they come from size because those are the things that reward investors for taking risk. You might ask, well, what about companies in a particular industry? 
What about tech companies? Don't tech companies have some driver of returns? The answer is they don't see it in the data. What about dividends? What about companies that pay the highest dividends? A little bit, it's a little indicator of value, but, but it's not nearly the indicator of price to book or size and so forth. It's not in the data. It's not in what are known as the T-stats. Who knows what T-stats are? T-statistics. T-statistics are, are um, um, numbers that show statistical significance. Whether something has statistical significance or whether it's just random noise. So if you said to me, hey, I want a higher return in my portfolio going forward. What would I say to you? Well, we need more small cap value, <laughs> right? Or something like that. Would I say, oh, well, we need to go buy Tesla stock because <laughs> it's a good buy. We assume here at New Capital Management and at Dimensional and frankly, at places that are modern investment houses, we assume that the market is usually putting a fair price on the assets. We assume that the market knows about what's going on on the balance sheet. We assume that the market knows about the bad loans. We assume that the market knows about the lawsuits coming from the Federal Reserve. If it's publicly disclosed, if it's material non-public information, that's insider trading information. We can't trade on it. But if it is material information that is publicly released, we assume the market knows about it and has put it into the stock price. Why wouldn't we? Why would we assume that the stock market is not adjusting for the information? We assume the market knows about whatever Elon Musk has said yesterday. We assume that the market knows about whatever is publicly available going into the iPhone. And so we invest according to what is statistically significant historically. Okay. <laughs>